Welcome everybody. Uh, this is the biweekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. I'm Dr. Alan Sherman, Professor of Computer Science at UMBC. Uh, today uh, we are um, going to have a talk by Dr. Nalanjan Banerjee, uh, Professor at UMBC, on his work um, with the CMOT project in which he's developing um, cybersecurity training programs and assessments for use in the manufacturing industry under a DOD grant. Um, this is the Friday before spring break. Um, we have a few more talks left, uh, quite exciting in our series. Also, I'd like to remind everybody that we will be holding uh, a third and final uh, application round for the SFS Cybersecurity Scholarships. The applications are due April 15th via Scholarship Retriever. It's a really good deal uh, for students who want to work for government. So thank you, uh, Nalanjan. We look forward to your talk. We are recording and we'll post the video on the Cybersecurity Center webpage. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Alan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for the invitation. I see that Ennis is actually in the um, in the audience as well. So Ennis has been uh, involved in this project um, in developing um, a version of the um, the manufacturing cybersecurity concept inventory, um, and some of his work is part of this presentation. Uh, so just uh, an overview of what this is. Uh, so this is Simot. Um, it's a training platform and curricula. Uh, just focused on cybersecurity for uh, manufacturing. So it's important to note here that we want to focus on operational technology. So this is the factory floor end of things. Uh, of course, cybersecurity and operational technology um, is cannot uh, reside in a silo. So a lot of cybersecurity attacks that happen on the operational technology side of things um, uh, enter the system through the information technology uh, component of the of the networks. So a lot of um, training around cybersecurity for manufacturing um, also relies on traditional cybersecurity on information technology networks. Uh, this is a joint collaboration between three institutes, um, UMBC, uh, MXD. Um, if um, you're not aware of uh, who MXD is, MXD is one of the 15 um, manufacturing institutes uh, funded by uh, the Department of Defense, the Department of Commerce, and the Department of Energy. Um, MXD is specifically uh, funded um, by the Department of Defense, and their goal is to uh, improve digital manufacturing um, for the defense industrial base. Um, and of course, cybersecurity is a is a key component of um, of what they do. And the UMBC training centers, uh, so UMBC training centers um, essentially provides training of various sorts, both to practitioners as well as professionals, um, on various aspects uh, of uh, of cybersecurity, manufacturing as well as other areas of uh, business and information technology. So the web portal for this, um, this particular program is, is out there uh, at simod.org. You can always go to that portal and, and take a look at what we are doing. It's a work in progress, the system. Uh, we have just finished off phase one of this project, uh, which is of course a small pilot of, of what we want to build. So, um, what is Simot, right? So Simot is a competency-based learning platform, uh, which just focuses on uh, cybersecurity uh, for manufacturing. So the way the platform itself works is a practitioner, a person who is actually in the manufacturing industry, opts for Simot and has a specific skill set uh, that this person comes with and an education profile. Uh, the practitioner opts to be upskilled to a specific role around um, cybersecurity and manufacturing. And this particular role uh, or group of roles are defined by this document called the MXD Job Hiring Guide uh, or Job Taxonomy, 
uh, which is a formal document which talks about um, the various roles in cybersecurity and manufacturing and digital manufacturing in general uh, that would exist in the industry today and that may um, exist in the future. So the practitioner uh, chooses to be upskilled to a specific role. Uh, for example, one of the roles that we have piloted is the cybersecurity analyst role. Uh, then Simot offers a personalized learning plan, which is a set of course modules to upskill that practitioner for that specific role. And at the end of this, uh, the practitioner earns uh, a certificate or in some cases, even a micro credential uh, for passing through the, uh, the learning plan. So the assessment of the course modules itself is done through a version of the cybersecurity concept inventory, which was uh, designed by Alan and his group uh, called the Manufacturing uh, Cybersecurity Concept Inventory. The only difference between the CCI and MCCI is the scenarios are very specific to attacks that have happened in the manufacturing industry. So just to recap, again, the, um, the practitioner comes to CIMOT uh, and um, comes to CIMOT and this practitioner could be a manager, could be a shop floor worker, Etc. Uh, essentially provides the set of skill sets that they already have uh, and want to be upskilled to a specific role in the manufacturing industry around cybersecurity. And Simot provides a personalized learning plan for that. Uh, so that's kind of the overall overview of, of what the platform is supposed to do. So who is the audience of the Simot platform? So companies, uh, this is very industry focused. Um, and it's funded by OLDCC, which is a Department of Defense funding agency that looks at improving infrastructure and workforce uh, in the defense industrial base. So of course we are focusing right now on the defense industrial base. So these could be companies looking to train new employees. So onboarding uh, companies looking to upskill employees for different roles, which is something that we are focused on in phase one. Certification for government contracts, um, that is another audience. Uh, continued education. Uh, we also want to open this up to individual learners who are looking for career movements and even individual learners who want to enter into the cyber manufacturing field. For instance, right now, uh, starting actually next month, we are going to pilot uh, one of the roles uh, for uh, community college students across the country. Um, so this would be a, a cohort of about 40 students who would go through the CIMOT uh, training uh, for a specific role, uh, which is, and they're not necessarily in the manufacturing industry, but uh, we want to create a pipeline uh, to the manufacturing industry. So right now we have, of course, like in phase one, we have focused only on looking at upskilling individuals for different roles. So the features, again, role-based training. So the courseware addresses uh, the need to acquire skills and skills quickly. Uh, necessary to protect manufacturers from cyber attack uh, and the curriculum uh, around these roles are crafted uh, around those specific job roles. Um, and this particular document um, that MXD has prepared, they have actually prepared it with, uh, uh, with input from the manufacturing industry. So these roles are not necessarily something that we cooked up, but this has been designed over a, over a long period of time uh, with proper input from both small, medium, and large manufacturers. Again, targeted at cyber manufacturing, um, our learning plans are developed to train and upskill workers for a variety of specific manufacturing roles. Uh, you get to learn from the best. Uh, the courses, uh, the modules are offered synchronously right now. We, we believe that having the user in the loop is probably what makes this platform um, quite different from say a Coursera, which would offer like um, training through, um, through videos where there is no human in the loop in many cases. So this, these are offered synchronously. There are lots of hands-on exercises that the individual goes through uh, which we have developed and we are building on top of. Uh, this is offered through the training centers uh, right now. Uh, of course, it's free for the students because it's grant funded but eventually we want to uh, be able to offer this uh, even for a cost. 
And we want to validate the courseware um, using the CCI for manufacturing. So the hiring guide is this document that is proprietary to MXD, but members can access it. We are a member of MXD. Uh, the hiring guide provides the manufacturing role. Uh, for instance, the manufacturing cybersecurity systems operator. Uh, that, role def uh, that role definition defines all the skill sets that are required for that role, the competencies that are required for that role, what the responsibilities uh, of that individual is going to be on a day-to-day -day basis, and of course, other things like, um, the, like salary and such. So what we do is from that role definition, we extract out uh, what competencies um, are required, and then we develop a learning plan which, um, um, which covers all of these competencies. So at the end of the learning plan, uh, the individual should be trained at different levels depending upon the role uh, on all of these competencies. One of the challenges, of course, is these competencies are somewhat high level. So it's extremely important that you can map these competencies to actual course material and learning plans, which is something that we do uh, right now quite manually, but, um, but um, that, that's required. Uh, so an example use case for SIMART, uh, student registers for SIMART provides educational background and the role they want to be upskilled to. And the first thing they do is they take a gateway course. Uh, which is the cybersecurity fundamentals course, which just talks about fundamentals of cyber, fundamentals of crypto, uh, fun fundamentals of network security and IoT security. And uh, the student is assessed throughout the course. And at the end of the course, they also take another larger assessment quiz. Uh, this really helps us understand what the, um, what the level of understanding of the student is as far as cybersecurity is concerned. Uh, one thing to note out here is our target population is very different from say a university where um, a lot of students would have kind of uniform skill sets. Um, of course, the level of, uh, 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 level of intelligence or, or the level of, um, of preparedness might be different across students, but at least we know that they are all high school students uh, who are getting into college, uh, roughly of the same um, age group and skill set. However, here the um, the target population is very diverse. So there are individuals who have been in the manufacturing industry for 15 years. There are others who have only been there for a year. Uh, some of them have some hands-on uh, knowledge on, on cybersecurity, especially in the bigger companies that can afford it. And, and then they, we have individuals who don't have any clue of, of cyber, uh, though they might provide information uh, during the registration process as to what their skill set is. We want to use the fundamentals course to have a more um, objective assessment of what the student knows. Uh, so based on the outcome, then SIMOT provides a learning plan for the student, uh, which are a bunch of course modules uh, and evaluations uh, that matches all the competencies. Uh, we did go ahead and build SIMOT on top of a, uh, of a open source uh, LMS. Uh, the only reason we did that is uh, purchasing another LMS first is quite expensive, which did not necessarily um, support uh, the budgets that we had. And second and more importantly, uh, the access to data from these LMSs are very um, limited. So if we build this from scratch using a, a web platform like Moodle, this actually allows us to get all the data that is possible, uh, almost real-time data of how the student is actually performing. Uh, and in phase two, we plan to build analytics that can provide more personalized learning plans to these students, which can change over time. So, for example, if uh, a student goes through, say, the fundamentals course and we find that, okay, their crypto knowledge is, is lacking, then we can always point them to a more fundamental course in cryptography, which is something they can take after and only after that, they would be able to take more advanced courses. So that analytics can be easily built and automated um, if the platform is ours. So this is an example of competencies, um, the type of competencies that we look at. Um, again, very focused on manufacturing. 
So this is a person, cybersecurity systems operator is a person who's actually on the factory floor. For a small business, this could be the CEO even, like there's small businesses usually have like one or two people and they have multiple hats that they have to wear. Uh, this individual should be good at cyber physical asset management, uh, system testing, should have a basic understanding of industrial control security, uh, understand fault tolerance, um, as well as process security. Uh, a basic working example, uh, working uh, knowledge of uh, supply network cyber resilience, uh, and of course, network security, uh, as well as incident handling and analysis. So these are again coming directly from the hiring guide uh, as they have determined like these are what the job responsibilities of this particular individual is supposed to be. Um, so based on that, we have defined these three courses in our pilot. Uh, the fundamentals course, which again goes through the basics of um, of cyber, uh, mostly also talking about some of the networking fundamentals, uh, scanning and protocol analysis, what an attack vector is, what threats are, how do you actually um, work on incidents response and system hardening. Again, these are very hands-on um, uh, courses. So every module that we teach uh, is associated with exercises that they have to go through so that they can actually get their hands dirty. Um, also, one thing to note here is each of these courses are 20 hours. Uh, so it's offered across three weeks, um, three days a week. Um, and given that these are industry professionals who are going through this curriculum, uh, we have adjusted the time so that it's in the evening. Uh, so once they pass the cybersecurity fundamentals course, then they take a manufacturing cyber systems operational operations uh, course, which focuses on IoT security and, and troubleshooting and uh, securing wireless systems. Um, and then we have a more advanced course uh, at the end, which is just focusing on operational technology cyber. So it introduces um, the OT systems, CADA, uh, DCS, PLC, uh, the threat to the OT systems, and also um, the mitigation methods. Uh, we also teach as part of these of the last course uh, some of the NIST uh, manufacturing standards, not in uh, a lot of detail, but at least an overview of uh, what NIST um, uh, publishes uh, for cybersecurity compliance specific to manufacturing. So that's covered as well. Um, and, and these are again synchronous courses. There is an instructor in the room. Um, of course, given COVID, um, we have this streamed over Zoom, uh, but the students can potentially interact with the, um, uh, with the uh, faculty member. Also, one thing to note here is um, uh, a lot of our students are geographically located at different, in different states. So in any case, if we offer this in person, there would be a hybrid mode where um, people would be able to log in and be able to um, get this training over uh, over video. And the and the courses are are offered through um, UMBC training centers. So the assessment of the course and and this is essentially looking at uh, a validated assessment tool for cybersecurity and manufacturing, and is based on the uh, cybersecurity concept inventory that Allen's group designed. Um, so this, and just to give you a little bit of an overview, you might already know about this. The CCI is designed to assess a student's conceptual knowledge. There are about 25 multiple choice questions based on concepts identified by the Delphi method. And um, the, uh, the questions are formulated based on student misconception. And there's a lot of work that Allen's group has done on this to ensure that those course, uh, the, those questions actually point out the student misconception. So what we did, um, actually Ennis built this, um, who is in the audience, um, it, we took all of these concept inventory questions and we morphed it for uh, manufacturing scenarios. So again, the concepts remain the same, identifying vulnerabilities and failures, identifying attacks against the CIA triad, dip, devising a defense and, and identifying security goals of the system, which is the same um, concepts that are covered by the CCI, but the scenarios that we use are manufacturing focused. And this is just one example here. Um, so on the left, I present the, the scenario 
and on the right, the inspiration behind this scenario. So for instance, um, in this particular scenario, um, an hypothetical character, Alice, who is the CFO of a, of a big company, a manufacturer of aircraft engines, suddenly sees this email, uh, so-called email from uh, her CEO. And of course, this is a type of a spam email to, to transfer large amounts of money. And this has actually happened uh, for a European manufacturer. And the link out here is here. So it's the FAKA um, BEC attack. So uh, the idea is to present this scenario and then present um, some follow on uh, questions to understand if uh, the student, what, what cues the student can take from this email to understand that it's fake. Right. So this would be something that a cybersecurity systems operator might face on a day to day basis. So, again, remember, this is a person on the factory floor um, could be a manager as well, and they are responding to these sorts of emails all the time. So what essentially in the email leads to uh, figuring out that this is a spam. So that sort of questions um, and. And then and the student, what he does is not only answers this question, but also provides a confidence score of how confident they are about their answer. Uh, what we found in our analysis, and I'll show you some data from our first cohort, while they were able to get the right answers, um, in many cases, their confidence was lower uh, before they took a course and the confidence increased after they, they took the course, though they were able to answer the questions more or less accurately uh, even before taking the course. Um, so a little bit, I, I'll come back to the demo in a little bit, um, but we do have a portal and I can show you like how the, the courses are organized. It's like any other LMS, but the interesting thing is we are also building some of these uh, analytics uh, plugins into the system that can in real time figure out how the student is is performing uh, or engaging with the material and then provide more personalized recommendations on how to improve their learning plans over time. Um, so let me talk a little bit about our first cohort and, and what we found and what data we, um, we got. So the first cohort um, we um, provided the three courses in addition to the um, it says the first two courses, but it's actually all the three courses. Uh, they were offered to a cohort of 20 students, uh, though the 20 students was only the limit that the funding provided, uh, though there was a wait list of at least another 10 students who were trying to get into the course. On the right, you can see a table of the companies that were involved in the first cohort. Um, so there are 10 manufacturing companies. Some of them are big manufacturing companies like Boeing and Dow and Rolls-Royce. And some of them are much smaller companies, um, which are small businesses like uh, Atlas Tools uh, and so on um, that were part of the cohort. Also, you can see that the position of the person going through this training was quite diverse as well. So some of them were policy and compliance officers. Some of them are actually cybersecurity operators. Some of them were IT technicians and so on. And this was done by design. Um, so when we chose individuals from um, this list of like 40 people who applied to be in this course, um, we chose it based on two criteria. One is we wanted a good representation of both large companies and small companies to really understand and get feedback from them. And the second criteria was we were basing our choice based on the diversity of the experience. So some of these individuals knew nothing about cyber while others actually were, had been working in the manufacturing industry or in area of cybersecurity for five to 10 years. So getting feedback from individuals with such diverse um, background really helps us improve um, the um, the quality of the course is moving forward. So, which was the goal of the of the first cohort? So, these are some initial data. Of course, the long term impact of this needs to be looked at. Uh, of course, the goal here is, I train somebody um, on a specific role. They go and start taking that role um, or executing that role in say Dow or a Boeing. You can only see if they uh, perform better or well right now and depending upon a long-term evaluation, which is what we uh, want to do right now in phase two, where we want to track these individuals for at least a year, year and a half, 
and then from the job managers try to understand if the quality of their work around cybersecurity has improved or not. But as short term uh, evaluation, we looked at the usefulness rating, which was extremely important. We explained what usefulness meant there. Usefulness essentially meant that uh, what they are learning there is adding to their knowledge bank for that specific role moving forward. So, and in almost case, all cases in a Likert scale of uh, zero to five, where five is best and zero is worst, we saw that um, the um, students really um, thought the course material was was useful with an average rating of, of 4.2 and upwards. Um, the other interesting thing that we saw is for the MCCI, uh, the pre-course MCCI and the post-course MCCI, the accuracy itself of answering the questions were more or less the same. So we used 15 questions for this one specific course in the second one, but we also um, we also uh, took into account the confidence that the student had on a scale of uh, one to five uh, for answering those questions. So overall, what we saw is for most questions, the confidence increased after taking the course. So these are again very uh, somewhat um, uh, the practical questions like uh, and you really have to think about how you would respond to them. Uh, so if you have high confidence in answering these questions, the uh, probability that you will execute it is probably higher. Though the accuracy itself, we did not see that change much. Some of the subjective impact, uh, we then profiled um, some of our um, students who went through this, um, this curriculum and just trying to understand um, how they applied it to their um, to their career. So this is one example, a great example of uh, Douglas um, Hillman, who uh, is now a cybersecurity analyst in Dow. He was not there uh, earlier as the cybersecurity analyst, but after taking SIMOT, uh, he got that role um, in in Dow. And of course, he um, claims um, he uh, he gives credit to to SIMOT for essentially getting into that role. Whether he's performing well or not so well in that role is something that a long-term evaluation would show, but at least he was able to get into that role and um, uh, he definitely thinks that um, he understands um, what he needs to do as part of that role. So some I, we have done profiling of, of multiple individuals, but this was one that stood out um, and that's what we are presenting out here. Uh, our goal again in phase two is to ensure that um, we can do this for all individuals, or at least a large subset of individuals who've gone through the uh, uh, gone through the first set of training. Um, so some of the future plans that we have for SIMOT, um, so we are expanding substantially, of course, um, with the caveat that um, we are looking uh, for funding from again from OLDCC to do all of this. Uh, we want to build learning plans for several other cybersecurity roles, especially those under um, uh, those around like machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, digital manufacturing and, and data driven manufacturing is becoming more and more uh, popular even in the defense industrial base. And the use of analytics techniques um, around uh, manufacturing has become more and more pervasive. So there are definitely questions around. Um, security of the machine learning model itself and applying machine learning for cybersecurity. So we um, are developing as part of phase two, or we'll start developing as part of phase two um, curriculum around those um, AI roles as well. Uh, we want to build a hybrid, uh, we want to build hybrid course modules as well so that we can scale the size of the classroom. What does hybrid mean? Um, so hybrid in this particular context means a combination of uh, course videos and having an uh, instructor in the, in the loop to answer questions. So we have already started uh, making videos, professional quality videos for the offerings that we had in phase one. And, but we still want the user or the, the, stu uh, the instructor in the, in the classroom or after the videos so that the students can interact with the, um, uh, with the instructor. And, and clarify any questions. So if you see one of these videos when they're available, you will see that the interaction uh, was one of the key components of the of the courses that we offered. Uh, we are we want to build more remote experiential learning modules into these courses. These are practitioners, and one of the big feedback that we received 
was we want more and more hands-on exercises. So one of the things that we are doing at UMBC is building an OT cyber range. So this is kind of a screenshot of what this would look like. Um, so essentially it's a miniaturized factory floor and um, the ability of students to log into this factory floor through virtual machines and be able to run um, uh, exercises on, on an actual miniaturized factory floor. That's kind of the vision. Um, it's not developed yet. Um, we hope to have this OT cyber range um, built by the end of this year and offered um, offer like course material and hands-on exercises as part of SIMOT. And we are also building some analytics that infers the learning plans automatically. And um, we want to pilot SIMOT um, on diverse participant populations. Again, we had focused only on the manufacturing industry, but we are in the future thinking of also looking at veterans who are out of jobs and who want to get into um, the manufacturing industry around cyber, as well as community college students. And finally, uh, we are working with the uh, Maryland uh, MEPs uh, to augment SIMOT with an apprenticeship program uh, for this specific role, uh, which is a cybersecurity analyst role. This apprenticeship program would be a 144-hour uh, curriculum, which would have the core SIMOT courses, but would also have other courses around it on more fundamental aspects as well as more advanced aspects. So again, uh, this has not been approved yet by the Maryland Council, uh, but we hope to present uh, the curriculum in front of the council uh, in the summer, and hopefully we'll get approved and then we can start piloting it end of this year. Uh, so that's all I have. I wanted to show you the platform a little bit. Um, and. Um, so if you, you can go to simod.org, um, this talks about the entire, uh, this is totally web-based, it runs on AWS. Of course, it has a front-facing website, uh, which talks about what the system is and what we offer. Um, one of the things that you cannot necessarily register with um, the, um, the system right now, um, automatically, and, and that is by design again, because uh, we only want to restrict access to SIMOT for individuals inside of the United States. Uh, so we don't want this, since this is funded by the DOD and um, we want to train the defense industrial base, uh, this is only by invitation. Um, but once you have an invitation, you can get into the platform. This is one example of a course. Um, this is the last course uh, that I mentioned, what things you learn. Everything would be available out here. Um, we have the pre-course survey and assessment that we mentioned. And the supplemental material. Uh, so we have virtual machine access. Actually, that's misspelled. Uh, that's what we use to have exercises uh, right now. Um, for instance, if you're talking about OT and ICS systems, we have built a lab, uh, which is basically a, a virtual uh, machine uh, image that every student logs into and can and do exercises. As a simple example, I think this is also done by cyber dogs and others um, at UMBC. Uh, if you want a firewall exercise, we have built one. Um, this is again a hypothetical example, a firewall exercise on a virtual machine and students can muck with an actual firewall, build one, protect their system and so on. Uh, we are doing this, of course, for specific technologies like ICS systems. There are simulators for ICS systems that we have built. Uh, what the OT cyber range would really provide is take it from a simulation to an emulation. So we'll actually have hardware that they can um, they can muck with. Uh, again, we collect a lot of data on, on users. Um, each of these courses has, I cannot show you the data, like the raw data, of course, due to privacy reasons, but we collect data on the engagement. We collect data on um, the, um, of course, the how they're doing on each of these smaller assessments so that we can provide them feedback uh, right away as to what they're doing right and wrong. And finally, of course, we look at these MCCIs to better understand if um, the course material that we are teaching is to the point or not. So the platform really collects uh, a lot of data for us. We have not even analyzed all the data um, that we have collected for these three courses. And, and the platform provides other stuff, of course, which is similar to any other LMS where you can keep track of grades and things of that nature, but that's not that important. So um, so that's, that's, I guess, all. Um, 
I don't know. I might have finished a little bit earlier than expected. Um, but that's the overall SIMOT system. Again, this is pilot uh, that we had done last year. Um, and we are looking for phase two funding right now to expand it to other roles, which would be another year and a half. We've not gotten it yet. And then after the after that, uh, we are hoping to um, to make this uh, available to um, the defense industrial base uh, at maybe a cost. But right now, we will be mostly building a lot of other roles and things of that nature. Yeah. So let me open to any other uh, questions that people might have. I'm curious to know um, how many students have taken your assessment tool? Do you have a name for that tool? And are you planning to do any formal validation studies of that tool, sort of analogous to the validation studies that we carried out for the CCI? Yes. Um, so right now, uh, 20 students have taken it. Uh, these are the 20 students who went through the cohort. And as part of phase two, we have plans of uh, formal focus groups uh, to do this, um, but uh, it's not started yet. Uh, we're waiting for some funding around it. Do you have a name for your assessment? Uh, we just call it MCCI. <laughs> it's Manufacturing Cybersecurity Concept Inventory. By the way, uh, this year we are carrying out a validation study of our second inventory called the CCA curriculum assessment. And we invite any qualified person to take it. A uh, qualified person means you're within a year of graduating or have graduated within a year in any cybersecurity program major track. And you can take it by going to the CDL website and following the links about the CATS project. That would be great. I think our manufacturers uh, who took the first cohort would be a great um, audience for it. Also, as I mentioned, 40 um, community college students are going through SIMART uh, starting next month. Again, it's a function of getting some funding, but almost the funding is finalized. Um, so there would be another cohort that could potentially take your um, take the assessment. Yeah. If you could send me some information on the web portal. I would be happy to get some more people to take. Oh, sure, I'll I'll put the link in the um, chat. Um, I, I'd be interested to hear comments from Ennis, who helped adapt the CCI questions about your experiences. Mm, do you want me to make the comments now? Sure. So the core the, the core assumption I went off of when I worked on it was that the misconceptions will be the same, and I think that's largely vindicated for the most part. But it's not a very scientific way of going about finding the misconceptions, but the idea is that cybersecurity and manufacturing is not meaningfully different than cybersecurity in general, except for the types of attacks you're dealing with. And that's sort of the operation I went on. And when I wrote the scenarios, I based every single scenario on a real cyber attack on a real company which is a slightly different approach to writing questions. Like it's a lot more similar to the nuclear test ban treaty question in the original CCI and CCA, right? Where it's like rooted in a real, like a, actually like a concrete real thing. Do you have any specific questions about it? Well, can you comment about what went easy and, and what caused difficulties to do this ad adaptation? I think um, rooting each scenario in a real question made it quite a bit easier to write to write good questions. Um, the difficult thing, of course, is still coming up with good distractors that are rooted in real misconceptions, which can become a bit difficult when you're dealing with something like a business email compromise. But I used the CCA approach of artifacts heavily. So even in the even in the example question that Dr. Banerjee demonstrated, it was like an email, right? So I asked a bunch of questions about that email. And that made it quite a bit easier to get good distractors going and stuff like that. So coming up with the artifacts can be difficult, but if you manage to do it, it really makes writing the questions easier. And I think it makes the scenario more engaging as well. Are there questions from the audience?
I had one about this. So the OT Cyber Range looks extremely cool. It's probably one of the the coolest things I've actually seen like in this year so far. Um, I wonder if there's, I wonder if there's like opportunities in the future if we do have a Cyber Range like that for Cyber Dogs to do like Cyber Defense exercises with that because that'd be incredibly pertinent, I think, to training people to defend uh, industrial, you know, industrial computer systems because it's just you could actually simulate what this really looks like you know down to every type of attack that you might face in that situation absolutely yes and um so i i did not give you the complete picture yet so the the cyber range that we are building at and uh, this would be housed hopefully at uh, bw tech north uh, which is just down the road um so we're getting some space out there um which was a skiff earlier, but um, we are uh, modifying that the tenant left to have a cyber range, which has two components to it. One we call the information technology cyber range, which is more of a classical cyber range where you uh, are able to do like um, IT cyber attacks. Um, it's mostly virtual, but of course you need machines uh, out there and there would be classrooms and things of that nature. Um, very similar to what you do at uh, for cyber dogs, but the I, I think the more unique component is is the OT cyber range where we are buying equipment from a uh, Siemens uh, for miniaturized factory floor, right? And this would have um, so what we are trying to this has three components to it. Um, just to elaborate on this, one is a miniaturized uh, assembly line, uh, uh, which has um, a robotic um, pick and place uh, machine to really emulate a, a real uh, assembly line. And the application that we are looking at is automotive uh, manufacturing. So assembling smaller, um, say cars, for instance, not end to end, of course, but at least parts of it. So the the, the can make of automotive um, would happen through, uh, through a 3D printer and, and then different components would be attached to build like a toy car, for instance. But though this is a miniaturized factory floor, all the equipment that's in here is industry 4.0 equipment. So for instance, the PLCs that are there, the conveyor belt, the controllers, um, even the uh, you know, software ERP software that runs on top of it. Uh, this is all state of the art uh, Siemens uh, software, which is used in the industry. Uh, the in and the other interesting thing about this is they provide interfaces to this so that you can uh, build cyber exercises to hack into different parts like like PLCs, for instance. So that that is something that we have to, of course, build on top of it. But those interfaces are provided as part of the package. So that's one part of that cyber range. Uh, the second part of the cyber range is um, a miniaturized uh, microgrid. So this is a renewable driven, small renewable driven uh, uh, grid. Uh, which then you can look at cyber attacks on the OT component of the grid as well. Uh, and then there is a third component of this, which is some, what we call the cyber wall. Uh, the cyber wall essentially looks at um, hardware that shows the interface between the IT component of uh, a, ma a manufacturing company and the OT component of the manufacturing company. So if you are aware of this, most of these attacks happen at these interfaces. In the past, what had happened was these manufacturing companies would be totally sandboxed from the outside world, so they would be very secure, right? Nobody would be able to get in. But once they have started digitizing things, they are integrated with the IT uh, system uh, associated with the manufacturing plant, and that's where most of the attacks enter the system. So we want to show through that cyber wall what sort of bad things can happen where the interface is not secure. Uh, so malwares in, get inserted into the OT component through, say, interface routers and things of that nature. So that cyber wall would be focused on the networking exercises. Um, so three components, the cyber wall, the miniaturized assembly line, and the third one is um, the uh, the smart, uh, the microgrid. So absolutely, yes, we want uh, students to be able to use it. Uh, we would also have industrial partners use it. Um, um, and, and pay for it, but for students, I'm, I'm guessing this would be um, uh, totally free. So, so that's the goal. Yeah. This is incredibly cool. Thank you for elaborating. Sure. 
I have a separate presentation on the cyber range, but uh, I can pull it up if you guys want to look at what it would actually look like. Yeah. And and I don't know whether you all know, but there's a huge push right now in the state of Maryland specifically on, on cybersecurity, not necessarily just manufacturing cybersecurity, but overall cybersecurity. And some of the funding we are hoping to get from the state. Nothing is finalized. Um, it's um, it's it's a hope right now, but I think that might happen because this equipment is quite expensive. Uh, the assembly line itself, like, costs about um, hundred fifty thousand dollars. The robotic arm costs about eighty k. So. People also may like to know that um, uh, we're involved in a project to improve how cybersecurity is taught and learned at the U.S. Military Academy. So we call that the EPIC project, and we're expecting to hear uh, very shortly from NSF whether or not they will be funding that project. And the, the signs look very good that they probably will be funding it. That's awesome. I think this might be an opportunity, Alan, for consolidating a lot of this work um, under one umbrella. I know um, you're the associate director for the center and kind of we do, we, there's lots of work that is going on, I think in silos, but um, this would be a very good opportunity to. Yeah, well, we should discuss that. Um, I, I think there's a great opportunity to combine what you're doing with the EPIC project. Okay, absolutely. And there'll be opportunities for um, students who want to get involved too. And if you're interested, just uh, send me email. So one final call for possible questions. So with that, um, uh, we thank you again, and I hope everybody has a good spring break. We'll see you back in two weeks. Thank you, everyone. Take care.